All right. Hi, this is Sheriff Jeff Gaylor, Hartford County Sheriff, and uh, welcome to this special edition of the Sheriff Spotlight. I, I, I got to say, I wish it was a happier topic that we were going to start off with uh, for a special one, but uh, today's episode, we're going to be uh, discussing the uh, Rachel Morin homicide case that our office has been investigating, and uh, we are now at the six-month anniversary since uh, that tragic day and that loss of life uh, here in our community and uh, you know still working hard on solving this case our investigators uh, are, are focused on it every single day uh, but joining me today for this special broad- broadcast is uh, Major Jack Simpson who's the chief of our investigative services bureau and uh, leading the investigation into the case uh, from our office is Captain Andy Lane who's the commander of our criminal investigations division and I'm going to ask Andy, just to, you know, we're going to get started here and just maybe a little bit of recap, although I think the whole world knows Rachel's story. We think uh, we know there's people out there who still need to be caught up. So a little bit about what happened six months ago. Yes, sir. So the, the sheriff's office uh, began this investigation when we received a, a phone call about a, a missing mother that uh, she had gone for a run that evening and uh, she didn't return. Her children, who were younger children, uh, one of them uh, a teenager and the other one uh under that age was were left at home and that wasn't like her. She normally would leave for a run in the evenings and be home within 45 minutes. So when she didn't return, a friend of hers called the sheriff's office and said that uh, they were concerned for her well-being and they didn't know where she was. Uh, the sheriff's office, of course, started looking right away and, and tried to find Miss Morin. And what they located right away was uh, Rachel's vehicle at a trailhead uh, along a popular trail here in Hartford County called the Ma and Pa Trail. Um, at this point, it was probably about later evening, 10 o'clock in the evening, and, and it was concerning that her vehicle would still be there because uh, although she frequently ran that trail, she would not have been there that late into the evening. Um, so that uh, began a large-scale search uh, through the, um, the Ma and Pa Trail and the surrounding area, uh, which ultimately, unfortunately, led to the, the discovery the following morning of, of, uh, of Rachel's remains. And I, and I remember that day, obviously, very vividly. Um, we had two missing person cases going simultaneously, um, one that was there was some concern, you know, or at least community concern that they could be related. And we knew from the information we had that certainly they were two distinct situations. Um, mm-hmm. One resolved uh, later, you know, fine for everyone involved. And sadly, um, Rachel's case resulted in the discovery of her body. So um, I, I think um, just a little bit, we'll go ahead into the uh, steps after the discovery. So uh, when, when Rachel's remains were located, the, the Ma and Pa Trail, if anybody's not familiar, is a, um, a large trail that runs through, like I said, a large, uh, about a seven-mile section of Hartford County. This particular uh, portion of the trail is well-graded and, um, and, and open. Off to the, along the side of this trail, there are uh, two uh, large drainage culverts that run under a, a, a local highway. Uh, those drainage culverts are hidden uh, during the summertime by trees and shrubbery, and aren't something that uh, that most people would see. I myself have been down that trail many times, and I, I wasn't aware that those culverts were there. Uh, in this instance, uh, we could see from the scene that uh, Rachel was ultimately attacked on the trail. That area of the trail, there is a bend in the in the trail that most likely was was used by the individual who committed this crime, who attacked Rachel on the trail, pulled her through the wooded area into these uh, um, into this drainage uh, culvert where she ultimately lost her life. And this is a little bit of information we've kind of held uh, close uh, to the chest, if you will, that we haven't um, released uh, as far as what the actual location of the homicide was. Um, so, you know, we are, um, again, as we sit this, hit the six-month mark, looking back at everything that we've done, um, some of the information that we've been less than, you know, a little leery about releasing too many details. Um, so this is this is something new. A lot of people ask me routinely is that where is that where this homicide occurred? And um, kind of everyone's familiar with the lar- who's familiar with the trail. Everyone local is familiar with the hiking trail that goes underneath of Route 24. Mm-hmm. These drainage tunnels are north of that a short distance, but as you said, in the summer particularly, you can't really make them out. No, they're they're uh, I would say they're not intentionally, but they but they are hidden by shrubbery and and. Uh and growth in a, a lot of people within the community, I don't believe are aware that they're there. It's not something that the, the average person would notice. Um, so it obviously the, the location of the, um, the attack was, was chosen, I think most likely for the, uh, because those culverts were as close as they were and they provided an area 
uh, for this person to try to commit this crime and not be seen by members of the public. At, at that hour of the day, on this particular day, is that trail well used? This portion of the trail is well used uh, at, um, during this time of the day. Uh, in fact, we've spoken to a number of witnesses who have been able to tell us that not only did they see Rachel that day, but they saw Rachel almost every day at the same time on the trail, walking and running and exercising in the same area. Um, this person obviously took the time to be familiar with the area because he was familiar with the culverts we spoke of. And he was also most likely or potentially familiar with Rachel who uh, had a time of day she liked to run. And uh, this individual uh, took an opportunity when Rachel, unfortunately, from the witnesses we spoke to, was briefly out of view of anyone else for a short period of time. And I, I've been asked that many, in many, many interviews um, over the last six months. Um, do we think that she was stalked, or do we think that this was a completely random act? And I've been doing, you know, police work 40 years. Yes, uh, Major Simpson's on par with me, and you're just slightly behind that. So a lot of police experience in the room. My, my gut tells me she was stalked. Um, but, you know, until we uh, catch this person, you know, we, I also, you know, have been putting out there, you know, that the fact that it could have just been a crime of opportunity. He could have laid in wait on that trail uh, for uh, Rachel or, or, or whichever um, female decided to come down that trail at a time when there were no other people in sight, you know, more or less a crime of opportunity. Um, so really that's kind of what we have said so far. We don't have information. We've developed no information to say she was specifically targeted. We have developed no information, sir, that says that she was specifically targeted. Um, however, in interviewing witnesses and speaking to people um, on the trail at that time, uh, it would appear that there was an individual who was uh, standing within the wood line in an area that's uh, slightly elevated uh, immediately around the time of this assault. And I would agree with you, sir, that I don't know that Rachel was specifically targeted, but I do believe that that area was chosen um, as an area that, that they wanted to assault someone. Right. Uh, yeah, it's, that's kind of the distinction we've made. I, I believe, you know, in my heart that she, someone picked her, specifically her, but we, we uh, until we have him in custody and we can uh, say that 100%, uh, it could have been likely he just picked the location and, and Rachel was the unfortunate person who was there at that, that time. That's correct, sir. So uh, from go ahead from there with kind of recapping. Um, so uh, Rachel, uh, as I said, was was located uh, on the trail that day inside uh, that culvert, and that began uh, a long process with the sheriff's office and our forensic services unit processing the crime scene and attempting to recover uh, any type of evidence we could that could link the suspect in this case to the scene. Um, that process took us the remainder of that day and, and into the, the following days as well. Um, after that, after the, the scene was processed, uh, a search began for, which is continuing to this day, a search began for witnesses who were in the area who could describe uh, what they saw, uh, who was in the area, and, uh, and anything else that would help, help us lead to the suspect in this case. As we were processing the scene and, and what moves happened in the days following, in processing the scene, we recovered um, genetic material that we were able to use uh, through the Maryland State Police Crime Lab to attempt to identify the suspect. That genetic material ultimately was entered into a system called CODIS, which is a, a national DNA database. CODIS contains not only known offenders, but it also contains DNA samples from other unsolved crimes with unknown suspects. In this case, CODIS was a huge break for us. And uh, what, co what we were able to do with that database was link this crime to another unsolved crime uh, in the uh, state of California in Los Angeles specifically, which was a, a, a home invasion is how I would describe it right now. Uh, and in that instance, that suspect left behind uh, a hat. And that hat was collected by the uh, Los Angeles Police Department and DNA was located on that hat and that DNA was entered into CODIS. When we entered our sample in from our crime scene, those two matched. So that allowed us ultimately to be able to recover video evidence that showed us who our suspect was, which we hadn't seen, and uh, allowed us to link two crimes that occurred on opposite sides of the country. And, and I do believe that's another specific piece of information that we've kind of not uh, been, you know, that we have not released previously as far as it being a hat that we, did we release that before? That we... We have we have publicly okay. commented so on hat. that. Yes. Okay, and I, I knew that 
the public knew that we had recovered DNA, or I should say Los Angeles Police Department recovered DNA uh, that matched to our uh, our crime scene here, uh, but I wasn't sure that they what, what the um, tool was or what the uh, item was that was left behind by the suspect. So um, going to that case, and it was in March, so it was basically six months earlier than uh, Rachel's case or five months earlier, uh, the case in in L.A., and, and I caused me to think, and this is a question I've got a lot, what brought the suspect here? And I've been clear that we really have no information to say that the suspect lives there and came here or that the suspect, very well, the suspect could live out here and have traveled out there in March. We know he was there in March. We know he was here in August. We don't know where he is in between. That's correct, sir. Uh, We know that uh, through the course of the investigation, which is in a unique situation when we have two violent attacks that happen on opposite sides of the country within a six-month period. Uh, we're, of course, interested about uh, what other crimes could have occurred throughout the country, throughout the state of California, state of Maryland, and everywhere in between. Uh, we have nothing right now that would indicate yet that there's been other crimes this individual uh, perpetrated in between. However, he could be, as you said, sir, a resident of the state of Maryland who went to California or a resident of the state of California who came here, or he could be a resident of another state and just traveled in between those two. Uh, until we locate him, we really won't know. Okay, and, and, and I know we've also, that case out there, I get that. Can you tell us more about what happened in Los Angeles? And I know that is not our investigation, and we certainly cannot speak on behalf of the Los Angeles Police Department. But as you said earlier, that's an active investigation by that police department. So we've been, I guess, limited in what we are uh, going to say or, or should say since another police department has a serious crime that they are also investigating. But what can you share uh, obviously the video came from there what else can you share about that scene out there uh, i think i can share the fact that yes this case is actively investigated by the los angeles police department who uh who did initially recover that hat which was a, an excellent find and and enabled us to be able to link these two crimes together uh, that crime that occurred there was also a violent attack um there's nothing that uh, we know right now that would point us to the, to the belief that it was anything other than um a random attack. Um, there were multiple people within that home who were uh, injured, and there were uh, minor children who were injured as well in that attack. I think that case, along with this case, highlight how uh, dangerous uh, this individual is and how important it is to locate him uh, for public safety. Uh, to be clear, the uh, the DNA that was collected from the crime scene in L.A. Uh, was that of an unnamed as of yet unnamed suspect. That's correct, sir. The The CODIS database uh, contain, does contain known offenders. I'm sure a, a lot of people are aware that um, people convicted of certain qualifying crimes provide a DNA sample that's, that's entered into CODIS. Um, but the CODIS contains also um, standards from unknown crime scenes. And this is an instance where we collected DNA or the Los Angeles Police Department collected DNA with an unknown suspect. But there's value to that, whether the suspect is known or not, because it allows us to link crimes together, as we did in, in this situation. Okay. Um, so go, um, go on a little bit with what we can discuss from that crime scene in, in Los Angeles. Um, is, there, is there more that we can speak about? I, I think we could say that um, I think people who see have seen the, uh, the video we released, which is obviously from Los Angeles, uh, this individual... Uh, approached a, a residence in the city of Los Angeles and um, entered that residence. He didn't live there. He was not known to the residence. Um, and after entering the home, I don't want to get into a whole lot of details other than to say that um, he violently and physically attacked multiple people to include a child uh, that were hurt during that incident. Um, and that, again, I think it just goes to um, the dangerousness and the um, – and the need for us to be able to track this person down before we harm someone else. Sure, and this is something else I get a lot of questions about and have spoken about that the escalation from what happened there in March. Again, we don't know whether he's there, here, there, where he might lay his head at night, but we do know um, from March uh, to August, he certainly escalated uh, in violence and in, in moving from assault, you know, even serious, but to taking a life. Um, the kind of the other questions I get uh, related to Los Angeles and the, and the cameras themselves are kind of twofold, and maybe I'll throw them both out there and see what you say, because one is we have um, the video footage of the Ring doorbell camera of him departing, 
uh, and the manner in which he departs, which does not seem in in most people's views to be the way that someone found in your home illegally assaulting people would be exiting a residence. Um, and if we have him going out, why don't we have him coming in? And when I say we, it's not, it's again, that's the Los Angeles crime scene. Yes, sir. Uh, the reason you can't see him entering the home um, is because the doorbell camera, obviously like we all have these doorbell cameras now in modern society are only placed on generally the area of the front door. Um, without going into to how this gentleman entered the home or the suspect entered the home, he did not enter through the front door and wouldn't have been captured by the doorbell camera. Um, as far as the manner in which he exited the house, uh, we've received comments through tip lines about that too. Um, and I think it, you know, we all have to take a step back sometimes and realize that um, this person entered a home. He, uh, in the middle of the night, violently attacked a family. And that family reacted. There's... Uh, they were scared. They were there was a lot of yelling going around in the, uh, at the time, and they forced him from the home. Um, I think people uh, oftentimes believe that the, this family should have uh, held this person there, or they should have, you know, in, in some way tried to stop him. And I think that's not always possible, and that the uh, this attack was stopped by a member of that family, who I think um, acted in the best interest of everyone there and did everything that he could do to get that person out of the home. And ultimately, um, I think. Although he did escalate his crime, uh, as we were just saying, between uh, here in Maryland and in California, I think had that crime that crime not been interrupted in California, it most likely would have ended the exact same way that, our crime ended here. That's a very good so, point. Uh, that's, and I agree with that from what I know of the case. Um, talk to me about the, the arm, uh, the infamous arm, because that's something that so many of our social media followers have commented on, mm -hmm. the, the arm in the video. The arm in the video is um, the suspect when he's in the home um, winds up assaulting two family members who were unable to defend themselves. A third family member who um, is a younger person uh, enters that room and manages to surprise that person, manages to surprise the suspect and begin to force him out of the home. Uh, as the suspect flees the home, uh, this individual who is frightened and is scared and is a younger person and doesn't understand why someone's in his home attacking his family members, the suspect, other people in the home begin to wake up. And he realizes now that there's multiple people in, in the home. They're yelling at him. He's trying to just exit the home. So as soon as he leaves the door, that younger person who actually interrupted the crime scene slams the door shut and locks it and then immediately calls the police. So again, we've heard this a lot too, and I understand people are trying to help, but it's a uh, it's a difficult situation that that young man went through, and I think he did everything he could to try to protect his family, and he just wanted this, the suspect out of his home. And then as soon as he left, locked the door and called the police for assistance. So obviously that's how we tie to Los Angeles and to the video that we were able to release. Um, and, and again, we uh, had a press conference releasing that video as soon as it came into our possession um, to make sure that the public knew what to be on the lookout for and, and hopes of identifying this uh, individual. And here we are six months in and we still haven't been able to get a name. And, and I believe somebody out there is going to see that video and recognize that, that person. And we just need to make sure it stays in, in the public eye to the best we can. Um, but how many tips uh, related to this case would you say you and your investigators have um, followed up on? And, and I get the question, you know, has this turned to a cold case at this point? This case absolutely is not turned into a cold case, sir. It's being act actively investigated every day. Uh, we were actually just today conducting interviews in this in this case. Uh, we've received well over a thousand tips, and every one of those tips is followed up on um, to ensure that uh, nothing's missed. Then they've come in from from all across the country. And where do you follow these tips? As far as can you outline a few of the tips that are the types of tips that you've received? Sure, we'll receive tips from people who, um, from the the very generic, from people who tell us that I was in a I was in a grocery store or I was at some other local business and I believe I saw somebody who matches the description. People who call us to tell us that they live in a different state, but they believe this individual uh, resides uh, in their community, whether it be an apartment community or whether it be a residential home. Uh, people who tell us that um, they have. Uh, family members who they believe could have been involved and where those people live. And um, really, it, it, it runs the gamut of people who I think, uh, you know, see this story, realize 
how tragic is it that Rachel, a single mother, lost her life and they want to reach out and try to help. Um, and it's been great. And every one of those tips, we'll take every tip we can and, and we try to run them down to the ground. And I agree with you, sir, that uh, we, you know we know through the course of the investigation, this individual was here in Hartford County, most likely for a couple of weeks prior, several weeks prior to this happening. And I agree that there are people here in our community who know who he is. He resided with somebody when he was here. He, he, he ate at local stores. He had a home, and there are people who know who he is. And what we really need is those people to realize that this is a dangerous individual, and they they really need to to step up for the community and identify who he is. And this would probably be a good time to point out that the, the reward on giving us that piece of information currently stands at thirty five thousand dollars to to give us information that identifies that subject and helps us make an arrest in this case. Yes, sir, that's true. And, and you did speak about the family, and I, I know from speaking to you, from speaking to the major, uh, and even seeing, uh, meeting with the family members before a canvas that some of your people did back right before Christmas. Yes, sir. Um, that, you know, we've been working with the family. Obviously, as you said, we have uh, Rachel, you know, the mother of five, right? Mm -hmm. um, a, a, a young mom, um, a sister, uh, a, a daughter. Um, this has really impacted very close family, um, and then it's hit our community because we, we live in a very safe place, so it, it's hit our community as well. But um, how other how are we working with the family on uh, trying to solve this case? We speak with, with Rachel's family frequently, and, and I would agree with you, sir, that um, Rachel was a mother. She was a daughter. Um, she was a friend to many people. She was a part of this community. She was raised here. She lived here her entire life, and um, it was devastating to her family. Her, her children don't have a mother now. She has um, children under the age of 18 now. She has a, a child who, unfortunately, is, is disabled that now has to cope with not only a disability, but the loss of their mother at a young age. Uh, her, Rachel's mother, um, is obviously devastated at, at the loss of her daughter. Her oldest daughter, who's uh, turned uh, 18, was 18 at the time of this, now has to try to navigate the beginning part of her adult life uh, without a mother. So it affected everybody in Rachel's life, and she had a wide circle of friends. And, of course, all of them are affected. And, and to your point, sir, too, we do live in a safe community, and it, it definitely uh, upsets everybody, and it makes it takes a little bit of that sense of safety away when something like this happens. And, and people ask about that all the time, the hiking trail. And um, we, we were just asked today, in fact, uh, on an interview, uh, are there cameras on the trail? And particularly somebody saw what they believed is a camera in the pedestrian tunnel going underneath Route 24. Uh, to my knowledge, there, I know that the county is working to put cameras along the trail because of Rachel's case, but not in it. there were not cameras there, and I don't believe there's one in the tunnel. No, sir. There's there's no tunnels on the trail itself. I mean, no tunnels. No me. There's no cameras on the on the tunnel itself, on the trail itself, and the cameras in the surrounding area um, that uh, we captured the arrival of Rachel into the parking lot. We know where she was beforehand. Stop uh, shopping at a local Target store. We have video of that. We certainly used video in this case to be able to track Rachel's movements in the time uh, leading up to this and to her arrival at the trail. Unfortunately, after Rachel arrives uh, and parks her car at the parking lot at the trailhead, there's no more video uh, evidence after that. All right, and that might seem, I don't know, outlandish in some parts of our country, but I have to say um, my, my backyard hits a portion of this trail, and we've lived there for more than 20 years, 22, 23. Um, you know, my daughters were raised going out there to be able to walk on the trail, my wife, me, um, and it, it just it's – so far outside the norm. I don't think many communities can understand just how, uh, what kind of feeling of safety there was prior to this case. Obviously, you know, this woke everybody up a little bit that were, as law enforcement will preach, you know, it, it can happen here and the worst things can happen here. And we saw that again in this case, sadly. Um, you talked about, so we talked about a little bit about working with the family and uh, how about other agencies? Obviously, this is a big case going from one side of the country to the other. How about other uh, partners. Yes, sir. We've used uh, multiple parts in this case, and we still do on a on a daily basis. Uh, the Maryland State Police Crime Lab has been an integral partner on this and uh, has helped us uh, with the initial genetic links we made. But as we continue moving forward with the case, has helped us uh, with further processing of evidence. Um, we've used uh, federal partners to help us reach out uh, across the country to different places to conduct interviews um, to give us uh, assistance again with. Uh, evidence processing and directions to, to take the case. Um, we've used uh, other local departments across the country when we needed to, to be able to conduct interviews and be able to 
uh, understand where potential suspects reside and, um, and crimes they may have committed in the past. We've used uh, laboratories from multiple states through the country to help th- so they can assist us try to track uh, the suspect as well. So we've received a, a tremendous amount of support from agencies throughout the country. Now, how has the community responded to your efforts during the canvases? Um, what's the response that the detectives are seeing? Uh, the response has been great from the community. They've uh, always been supportive of the sheriff's office my entire time working here, and they're continuing to be supporters of the sh- supportive of the sheriff's office today. Um, I think the community has told us the people we've spoken to uh, exactly what they saw. The people we've spoke to. I think if there's one thing that if I could, uh, hopefully people would understand is that we know the suspect, and I touched on this before, was here in Harford County prior to this incident. He didn't arrive that day and leave that day. He was here beforehand. And when he was here, just like all of us in our daily lives, we interact with the people around us in businesses. We interact with people in restaurants. We reside somewhere. We have neighbors. Um, there are people who live in this community or who were in this community at the time of the event that um, certainly would have interacted and seen the suspect. And those are the people that we need to come forward and tell us who this person is and where he is now. And uh, one thing, I'm just kind of looking through my notes I um, to kind of frame my thoughts, but uh, jumping back, and it's a DNA answer, obviously, but we get the question, we, we put out there, obviously, this person's of Hispanic, our suspect from the video is of Hispanic descent. What makes us confident enough to say that? Uh, through the course of the investigation, uh, we obviously, like I said, we, we processed DNA and genetic material and that along with video evidence, uh, allows us to conclusively say that this person is from, has a Hispanic origin. So one of the things we got a whole lot, a whole, whole lot on our social media was related to the DNA. And it was, you know, if you have the DNA, how do you not have the name? And people weren't able to put that together. So, um, w- with that, can you kind of explain why we don't have a name just because of a DNA match and then how confident you are or we are in the DNA match we have? So we are uh, highly confident that the DNA that we recovered from the crime scene points conclusive, conclusively to our suspect. However, the way DNA works is it is able at this stage to connect us through the CODIS database we spoke about to another unknown crime. There is no DNA database that would be able, allow me to be able to plug that in there and have it just just give me a name. That's not how it works. The only people that are um, that are named in a CODIS database people who have committed a qualifying crime. So if you haven't been arrested and committed one of these crimes and been to prison, then your name is not in a database. There is no uh, you know massive database with everyone's DNA. That's not how it works. But what it does allow us to do is to link these two crimes, and when we do locate our suspect which we will, it will be able to conclusively link him to the crime scene. Right. Uh, and, and again, kind of related to that, one of the questions I get, because, you know, the DNA has told us of Hispanic descent, is do we believe that the suspect in this case is in the country illegally? We know that the border is a big issue in our country right now. Um, my answer to that is uh, we don't know, and we don't want to rule that out, uh, nor do we want to um, say that's a, that's the way it is. It's just another possibility uh, because uh, we said he could be laying his head anywhere from Los Angeles to here or really anywhere in the world. So we don't know. So, I, I mean, do you have any thoughts on that response? Uh, it, I mean, it definitely does complicate things. Uh, you're correct, sir, that he, he could be a U.S. citizen from California or a U.S. citizen from any other state. Obviously, um, there's been an influx of, of people from certain parts of the world here in the United States, and there's people who move through um, the, our southern border a little more uh, freely, and that does complicate things, and it allows people to be able to uh, move, and it, allow, it makes it uh, difficult to be able to track people through traditional means. It just adds another uh, a layer of complication. Okay, and again, yeah, one of the to focus on that as being a fact when we don't know it would be wrong, and to focus to ignore that. Um, without knowing that's not the case would be wrong. So our, our, you know, we haven't been able to put it either way. So that's uh, an open-ended question, I guess, if you will. The other big question I get all the time is, you know, why not a sketch? You, ha- you have the video, you addressed, you know, we have the video of him leaving because he didn't come in that door. Um, wh- where are we with some sort of sketch or something? So we, we, began, we began the investigation and made this um, link. One of the first things we would do in any case is try to locate witnesses. 
uh, one of those witnesses that we did locate in this case uh, was a victim of that California assault. Um, sketches uh, are absolutely a, a phenomenal investigative tool. However, they are one person's impression of what someone looks like. All of us view people differently, and it can change the way that sketch looks. Uh, we do have a sketch that we're planning on releasing soon. That This sketch was not one person's interpretation of what our suspect looked like, but uh, looks like, but multiple people's impression, both uh, victims from California, witnesses here in, uh, in Harford County, and then also uh, the artists using the video as part of the rendering as well. So being able to put all those three things together, we believe that we have a sketch now that um, is the closest uh, rendition we're going to be able to have, and we want the public to be able to see that as well. And, and it may actually be released ahead of this podcast, depending on uh, timing, if uh, depending on how it all works out. Yes, sir. So as far as the sketch goes, explain how important it is to try to get it as close as possible to the actual suspect and what efforts you took to make sure it's just not another Hispanic male being sought. So it's, it's uh, important to get this sketch as close as we can, because the one thing as an investigator, I don't want to do, I don't want someone to look at this sketch and think, well, I'm not going to call the sheriff's office and tell them that I think I know who the suspect is because he doesn't look enough like this sketch. So we want to make sure that we make this sketch as close as we can get it to the what the suspect looks like so that we can make sure people um, are confident when they're calling us and people understand what the suspect looks like. So in order to get the best quality we could, we utilized uh, uh, witnesses in California who were assaulted by the suspect. We used um, witnesses here in Harford County. Um, and then we also used uh, one artist to combine all, to, to interview each one of these people and then that same artist to look at our video and be able to try to put all of that together to give us the closest um, that we could possibly get to what the suspect look like looks like. And then after that, we took that sketch and we talked to other witnesses who didn't maybe see the person as well and weren't confident in making a sketch but did see the person and asked them, does this sketch look like the suspect that you saw so that we were sure that we had uh, as large a group of possible who knew saw this person look at the sketch and say, yes, this is similar to what the person I saw looks like. We definitely don't want to be out getting calls or um, in, in interviewing a lot of folks that just because they're Hispanic. Um, so a lot of effort was taken. And one of the things that, that I did hear, and I think it's important is that we do have witnesses here in Hartford County. We do, sir. We have, we've interviewed multiple, many witnesses here in Hartford County. Uh, as I mentioned, Rachel uh, ran the trail frequently daily, and uh, a lot of those people came forward and told us just when they saw Rachel. We had other people come forward and tell us that, you know, we saw the video and that they felt like they saw someone who looked very similar to the video uh, on the trail in the weeks leading up to uh, Rachel's death. And the volume of people that we've spoken to who told us that they saw someone on the trail who looks similar to our suspects, to our suspect in the week leading up to the crime, um, makes me believe, as I said earlier, that this individual was here in our county for weeks prior to this event. So those witnesses have linked this particular individual that they personally saw to that trail and around the same time that Rachel was killed. Yes, sir. Yes. And I do think it's important to note we are one year out nearly from uh, what happened in Los Angeles and six months out from Rachel's homicide here. So, you know, we are at, this is what that person looked like six months ago, a year ago. Yes, sir. Um, which was consistent between the two because we've had people from here and there both kind of say this is a more accurate rendition. So, um, or rendering, I guess, is more appropriate. So, uh, again, there's been some time. So, you know, hair grows out, or in my case, falls out. It, you know, people can change their look. So we're asking people to, when they see the both the video and the images, to be mindful of this is um, now six month, six month anniversary. And when uh, right. we release these sketches, one of the things that the the public will see is there's two sketches. One of these sketches uh, is this person, uh, his facial features only, and the other one shows the individual wearing a, a hat, a red baseball style cap. Uh, that cap, that hat is something that we know from interviewing 
uh, different witnesses is something that the suspect has worn in the past. So it, again, to your point, sir, people's, uh, people can change the way they appear through gaining weight, losing hair, wearing hats and sunglasses and, and things like that. And, and so w- with all of this we've discussed so far, um, again, six months in, wh- where do we stand today? Uh, today we stand that uh, still every day we're working this investigation. We're speaking to witnesses. We're still um, working with uh, allied agencies and partners federally on the federal side and on the state side. Um, we're interviewing uh, witnesses as late as uh, this morning. We were speaking to somebody. Um, we're using every available tool that we have to try to find this individual. And I, I know, you know, again, many, many years of doing this, there are cases that stick with all of us. How are your investigators doing with the the personal aspect? You know, we, we, we can't even imagine being in Rachel's family's shoes, you know, the, again, back to the children losing their mom, just the devastation to, to this family, um, you know, not trying to compare it in scope in any way imaginable to that. But obviously with a police officer, you know, this, this kind of case sticks with you. How are, how are your people doing with that? I think um, they're motivated. I think they – look at a crime like this and the tragedy that it caused and the violence that was involved both here in California and and in Maryland. And they're motivated. They want to find this person and um, they want to take them off the streets so that no one else is injured. And they want to bring justice to Rachel and to her family. So uh, they're working hard and they're motivated every day. And uh, I have confidence that, uh, that they're going to find this individual. I I tell you, we all, we all pray for that outcome for sure. And again, I got to, and you know, I'll let you offer any thoughts or the major uh, on our Hartford County community. Again, you know, we've been through some over uh, the last 10 years or so, been through some devastating events. This, this case is up there and, and the things that have impacted our community. Um, uh, what kind of words do you think about sharing in reference to our Hartford County community? Well, I mean, I would start by saying to the, the community as a whole that uh, we, I appreciate everything they've done so far. We've received, hundreds and hundreds of tips directly from the community here. Um, They're always willing to speak to us. We've done multiple canvases through the community, and everyone always is is willing to come out and speak to us to tell us what they saw to try to help us. Um, I would just ask that um, they continue to do that, to try to remember Rachel, remember the area that she was in, to if anybody remembers anything moving forward that they think it's important or not. If it's a small detail, those small details can be the details that, that, that break the case open. Um, so I'd ask them to do that. And uh, anybody who hasn't reached out to us, uh, who saw anything that day, who is aware of a person who uh, was in the area then and isn't here now, if they've seen a, the, the video and they have a basic idea what this person looks like or when they look at our sketch, do they know that person here? Is he here now? Did he leave? Did you see this person because you worked with him? Uh, any information that they can, uh, they can provide would be great. The... Um and just one thing to add is the local business community has moved mountains to help investigators and during the investigation, and not only the local business community, but the national business community and, and some some offerings from big companies in the surveillance world that have really stepped forward to uh, to give us a hand, which has moved us forward. And it, it can't go um, unsaid that we have more offerings uh, coming in every single day. We do uh, every day, and I think everybody looks at this case and they realize how tragic and needless it was and um, how devastating it was for Rachel's family, and I think uh, our community here is is a close community and it's a safe community, and I think when people hear or see something like this, the first thing they want to do is they want to help, and we have had a a tremendous amount of help from within the community, business community, from uh, from the state, and from people out of state as well who just want to try to do the right thing and and find this person before hearing someone else. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll just, um, I guess, around the room, any closing thoughts before we wrap this uh, special edition broadcast, uh, podcast, spotlight, the sheriff spotlight before we wrap up uh, this episode? I, I would just uh, reiterate again, uh, and anybody who has, has seen anything or anybody who feels like they have information that could help the investigation, please reach out to the sheriff's office and, and let us know what you have. Every bit of information that we can develop or that is provided to us is followed up on. And you never know what that tip is going to, to lead to. Um, so if you, even the smallest bit of information, please come forward and provide detectives with an opportunity to follow up. 
and, and I'll say both Andy and, and the major uh, have, have said it. Um, I, I, I've said it in many interviews. We're we're one good tip away from a name that lets us bring this down and get this guy off the street. My fear is uh, that wherever he is, he's going to do something like this again, and um, some other family, some other community is going to be um, suffering as we have, and we certainly, again, we don't want uh, Rachel's family to be, you know, uh, to have another uh, family going through what Rachel's family's had to deal with through this loss. Um, and, and if anyone has any tips, and again, as the major said, no matter how small, it might seem like the most insignificant thing and not worth bothering the police, it's worth bothering the police. Um, RM Tips, uh, Rachel Bourne, RM Tips at HartfordSheriff.org, and the phone line's 410 836 7788 for the tip line.